Hey everyone, so before we get started, I just want to briefly discuss a new service that I'm offering. Um, I have people reach out to me online pretty frequently. They hear about me being a self-taught developer who got into the industry with zero experience, and then, you know, I'm making good money. I've worked with companies like CNN, TBS, DirecTV. I have good projects under my belt. They're like, man, how did you do it? Like, you are a self-taught programmer. You didn't go to Stanford and Caltech and all these big-name schools. You know, you don't have Google and Facebook internships. Like, how did you get it done? And I've had people from Georgia Tech with CS degrees ask me this. I don't have a CS degree, and I make more money than them. They're like, dude, what are you doing? So if you want advice on, like, how to craft your LinkedIn, how to get your very first job in the industry, uh, some interviewing tips, some advice, how to sell, how to negotiate a salary. I doubled my salary one time. I had to hang up on these guys three times before I doubled my salary. If you want advice and information, some tips on the lessons I've learned over the past five years trying to break into this industry and build the portfolio that I now have, this newsletter is for you. So if you're interested, you're just getting started in the industry and you want some advice, check the link below and sign up for that newsletter. Hello and welcome back to Code Companion. This is episode number five, and in this episode we're going to look at functions. But just to briefly recap uh, from last week, last week we looked at the methods and properties available to us in JavaScript. So we took certain data types uh, like arrays and strings, and we saw the dot length property that would either give you the length of the string or the length of the array. And then we also saw some methods like character at or the car at method uh, where you pass it a index or an integer and it gives you the specific character within a string and then we also looked at the logical and and the logical or operator and saw our truth tables you know true and false that we could combine with like if statements to control the flow of our logic and we wrapped all this up by writing for loops uh, which is the first real programming we did or the first thing that felt like we were you know, kind of doing real programming, where it wasn't just us writing lines over and over again, and every line we write is run, we got to write a loop that would just run and reduce some of the repetition in our code for us, so that we wouldn't have to write console.log for each character in a string. Instead, we could write a for loop to iterate through the string, and then just console.log at once. Uh, which brings us to functions like console.log. This entire time through this entire series, we've been calling functions like that. And I've said that we would eventually get to writing functions, and that's what we're going to do today. So the first thing we're going to do as usual is make a new directory using the mkdir command. We're going to make a new directory called webdev slash functions. And then we will use cd to change directories into that. And then within this directory, we're going to use the touch command to create a new file. And we'll just call this uh, file functions.js. So touch functions.js. And then if you do ls, you can now see that function. And then we're going to open Visual Studio Code and just load that folder uh, into Visual Studio Code. OK, so now we're in Visual Studio Code. I can just, if you want to hide this little thing to the left, you can just do command b. And we'll make this a little bit bigger for you guys. And remember, JavaScript, when we, when we call functions, you can call functions with zero or more arguments. You remember arguments being those things that we're wrapping in parentheses. So we could do something like this, console.log, going back to our very first program we ever wrote, hello world. We have console.log, and then we have one argument right here, which is the string hello world. But you don't always have to provide an argument to a function call. Like if we did let sales equal 5, 250, and 3 like this, you can do sales.pop, which if you remember the dot pop method, which we can just highlight here and it'll tell us tell what it does for us, removes the last element from an array and returns it. So we call this method, we don't even have to provide it anything. We just call the method and it does it. It just removes the last element from, from an array. Now the reason we have functions is to take bits of code, usually that are very related, and isolate them into a single task. So similar to the way that you know it, early on when we had our greeting message that we were just repeating, we said, hey, let's reduce the amount of times we're 
you know, copying and pasting this string and let's just assign it to a variable and then we can use that variable. Well, similarly, if there's a bunch of statements in your code that you're doing, like if there's three statements in your code and you're saying, man, I keep doing these three things over and over, you can take those three things, move them into a function and then just calling that function using a name, kind of like we do with a variable, will execute all three of those statements for you. So let's look at our first function. And we're going to do a, or write a function that does something pretty basic. You're going to give it a string, and then it's just going to return another string to us, and it's going to tell us if we provided it a string or if we provided, provided it an empty string. So the way we write functions is we start with the function keyword. So we do that, then we add the name of our function. So we're going to do evaluate string. Then we do our open and close parentheses, which is similar to the way we call a function. But when we call a function, we give it values. When we define a function, we define values we expect to receive from whoever is calling the function. So here we're just going to put something like string. So we'll say that we expect to receive a string when this function's called. Then we do our open and close braces. And within the open and close braces right here is where we write the code for our function. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if string. So if there's, if a string is passed to us and it has a value, if it's truthy, we'll say return the string has a value else return what string so now that we have our function defined we need to call our function because just defining a function as we've done here just says here's this function and this is what what it will do but it's not actually going to be run until we call that function just like we did with alert just like we did with console.log just like we did with the pop method earlier the function isn't executed until it's called. So we'll declare a variable first, and we'll set it equal to evaluate string, and we'll just pass it an empty string. Now the reason we declared a variable here, let first and set it equal to evaluate string, is because our function returns a value. Just like earlier when we saw pop, and if you remember back to our previous episode, uh, sometimes functions will just do something, but sometimes it will also return a value. And when we saw, let's just do this real quick, dot pop, highlight that, it says removes the last element from an array and returns it. So when, it's, when there's a return value from a function, or if you've defined a function yourself and you have return statements like this, what it's saying is that it's going to return the string back to you when you call it if the string has a value otherwise it will return this string so that's why we've declared a variable and set it equal to the function call because we expect to receive a value in return and just below this we'll actually declare another variable we'll once again call evaluate string but this time we'll add a string in like that and then we'll do console.log first and console.log second so we'll save that and let's just run through this real quick so here we're declaring a variable first and we're setting it equal to evaluate string with an empty string so once this is called it's going to go up here and it's going to say if string an empty string isn't truthy so rather than going into this if statement it's going to go down to this else and return what string so now the value of first is what string and then we go down here, second equals evaluate string, this one. Once again, we go into evaluate string. If string, since this string has a value, now it's truthy, so the string has a value should be the value for the variable second. So here we'll see what string, and then the string has a value. So we'll go back to iterm. You can clear this, do node, functions, run that what string the string has value. If you don't want to do this, if you don't want to set the function to a variable and then log it, you could just avoid this entirely. So what you could just do is uh, this. So rather than setting the calling the function, setting it to a variable, and then console.logging that variable, instead you can just console.log the function call itself. 
Uh, so again, down for this one, we can get rid of that, remove this variable second, and then now instead of console.logging a variable, we're just console.logging the return value of a function call. So once again, we can save this, go back to our terminal, run that, and you'll see that it still works. Uh, going forward, feel free to use whichever one you choose to use. Uh, the point that you have to understand though, the key point, the key takeaway here is that functions can return values. When you see this return, when you're defining a function, you can declare a variable, and when you call that function like this, because of these return statements right here, know that once it's called, it's going to return that value back to the variable that you set it equal to. Now, up until this point, we've been using the terms parameter and argument without really clarifying the distinction between the two. And the distinction between the two is small and one that even very seasoned programmers get wrong. Uh, but I think it's worth just telling you what it is because it's a common interview question, which in my opinion is kind of irrelevant because once you get into the industry, people just throw around the two terms as if they're the same thing. But just to inform you guys, there is a difference. So let's get rid of these console.logs. We'll just have the function call themselves just to reduce a little bit of the clutter. So actually we're gonna have to go back to that anyways, but whatever. So an argument is what's within the parentheses when you call a function. When you're calling a function, the thing that you put inside of the parentheses, whether it's one, two, or three, or more, those are the arguments. The thing within the parentheses up here, when you've defined a function, that is a parameter. So when you're calling a function, the values you're providing to the function, those are arguments. When you're defining a function from the function's point of view, the bits of information that it's receiving and the names that it has up here, those, as you can see, are parameters. Now, what does this mean in practice? Well, the parameter names, like string here, is essentially irrelevant from the function caller's point of view. When the function caller is calling the function, they're just giving it values. They're saying evaluate the string, here's an empty string, evaluate the string, here's a string. The name of the parameter is completely irrelevant to the function caller. And we can illustrate this point by changing that parameter name to LOL. Now of course we had to update our reference because now string doesn't exist because we changed our parameter name. So we changed our parameter to LOL, we changed this to LOL, and what we're going to do is go back to console.log so that we can see that this still works uh, as it was before. So we're going to do a little up arrow, run that, and we see it's still giving us the exact same results. The name of the parameter is specific to the function itself. So the parameter is essentially a placeholder for the value that's being passed in. But even though it's a placeholder, it's still helpful to give it a descriptive name because LOL doesn't tell you anything about the value that's being passed in. Whereas, you know, something like string at least tells you, hey, this is supposed to be a string, you know, so you want something descriptive and this will become a little bit more clear in one of our later examples. Now, if you're still like, okay, I get the difference between argument and parameter, but I don't think I'm going to be able to remember which one's which, well, just remember that when you're calling a function, you're providing it an actual value. Like we're providing it this empty string or we're providing it this actual string. Up here, again, that's just a placeholder. So when you're calling a function with an actual value, actual argument, both start with A, that's kind of how I remember it. If I'm calling a function given an actual value, okay, A, that's an argument, and then function gets P, parameter. There's really no easy way to remember that one. Okay, so before we move on, we're gonna write just one more function, and this function is just gonna be a simple function. You're gonna give it just one number, and it's going to square that number. So once again, we're gonna start with function, we'll name this function square and then in the uh, open and close parentheses we're going to specify one parameter and we'll just call it number 
and then we do our open and close braces and then we're going to return the square of the number so we're just going to do number times number like that and then we can go down here and we can console.log we'll do square two and we'll also just do it the other way so we'll do like let result equals square three and then we'll do console.log result so here we have console.log square two that should print out four then we have let result equals square three that just assigns the square of three to result which should be nine and then we console.log result which should be nine so we'll save that go back to our terminal node functions tab hit enter and we see four and nine hopefully i said those numbers correctly i can't remember all right now we're going to move on to enhancing a little bit of javascript we're actually going to write a function that actually gives us a better version of what javascript gives us so we're going to do this with the javascript date object now this is going to look a little bit weird so what we're going to do is we're going to declare a variable now and we're going to set it equal to new date with an open and close parentheses now what this is is it represents a specific date or a specific moment in time both date and time now i get this syntax looks a little bit weird this new keyword the capitalized d the open and close parentheses that looks a little weird and i really hate doing this but just bear with me for now if you want to work with the date in javascript just do this new date open and close parentheses syntax it's just out of scope right now before we can get to that you have to understand functions so we're going to use this for illustrative purposes because it's going to help us write a pretty good function but we just can't cover that right now so again i hate doing this but there are just some things in programming you can't cover before you cover things before it so uh we'll get to that in a later video i promise we will create our own objects and this will make sense eventually so what we're going to do is we're going to do console.log now and just to see what that is we've created a new instance of this date object that javascript gives us what is now so we'll go back here we'll run our code and we'll see it this kind of cryptic looking thing but if we look at it close enough we see okay 2018 that's the year 06 that sounds like the month 21 okay this is corresponding to my date up here and then we see 1904 that's like some military time but at least the minute adds up, or corresponds roughly to my clock uh, but we want to enhance some of the functionality that's on this and specifically we want to enhance and actually before I call that function I'm just gonna go to MDN just so you guys know how to find some of this stuff and then we'll there we'll see date so we're gonna click that and here you can see some of the code we've kind of already seen this new date thing but they've actually provided it an argument we didn't um, but what we want is down here so we have our some of our methods date methods we want this get day it says it returns the day of the week 0 to 6 for the specified date according to local time so we're going to go back to visual studio code and we're going to do now dot get day so and we'll go ahead and get rid of that console.log so we're going to save this go back to our terminal run that and it gives us four which isn't that good for the average person if you wanted to write a greeting message to somebody or you wanted to say like hey you have to be there on this day javascript's dot get day isn't very helpful because it's just a number and on top of that the person who gets that number also has to know that it starts from zero not exactly the most human readable thing ever so what we're going to do is actually write a function that takes a JavaScript date and gives us the day of week in return. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up here and we're going to create our function that's going to take this get day and instead of returning us a number, it's going to return us the day of the week. So we're going to declare a function and we're going to call it day of week. And then its parameter is going to be date. So what we're going to do is we're going to 
uh, declare a variable days, and I'll get back to this whole const thing in a minute, but we're going to declare a variable days, and we're going to set it equal to the days of the week. So we're just going to create an array, and we'll do Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday. So that gives us our days of the week. So we start from Sunday because if you'll remember, uh, or actually you don't remember because we never looked at it. The get day method returns the day of the week for the specified date according to local time where zero represents Sunday. So that's why in our variable or in our array, we started at Sunday instead of Monday because the documentation says zero means Sunday. So then down here we can do return days and then we use bracket notation because we want a specific index. And then instead of providing it the number, we're just going to do date.getDay. So that's our function. So we're going to get a date. We declare a constant days, which is set to an array of every day of the week. And then we return the specific element within the array using the getDay function. So now down here we do let now equals uh, new date and we'll do console.log and we'll make a big string out of this happy plus now we have to call our function day of week day of week we're going to give it now because that's the date uh, object and then we'll do plus and we'll add a little exclamation point on the end so now we create a new instance of date, assign it to the variable now, and then in our console.log, we have a function call to day of week with that variable now. Once it gets into the function day of week, it declares this variable set to the array, and then it returns the specific element within the array using the dot get day function, which returns that number. So we'll save this, go back to our terminal, run our code and we'll see it's happy Thursday. Now, just to be clear, when you're working through this, if you don't see happy Thursday, that's okay. Because remember, the JavaScript date, ox date object is a specific moment in time. So it's literally the second you run that, it's creating a date object. And it's going to depend on what day it is that you're writing this code. So the reason I'm seeing Thursday is because I'm recording this and it's actually Thursday. So if you're writing this on Friday, you're writing this on Saturday, you run your code and you're like, oh my God, I'm not seeing what he's seeing. It's okay. Just check the calendar, make sure everything's okay. Okay, so hopefully that was a little cool, right? We got to write this function. It gave us a more human readable version of the dot get, get day function. That wasn't cool. So we're like, hey, let's just write our own function day of week. But we got to come back to this const thing, right? Because up until now, we've been declaring variables like that. We use the let keyword. What the hell is const? Well, const stands for constant, and it's another way of declaring variables, but the keyword const is for a variable whose value cannot change, hence constant. Um, so let's see what this looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a variable name, and we're going to set it equal to just my name. And then below this, we're going to try and reassign the value of name. And we'll do console.log name right there. So we create a variable, we declare a variable name, set it equal to the string Adam, then we reassign the value of name to the string Morgan, and we console.log that. So we'll go back to our terminal, clear this, run that code, and we see Morgan. So it overwrote the value of name because we reassigned it here. But what happens with a constant? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a constant with the name pi. We'll set it equal to 3.14. Then just like we did with name, we're going to try and reassign the value to something like that. And then we're going to console.log pi. So we'll save that, go back to our terminal, run that code, and we'll see Morgan is still printed okay, but then we get an error. And notice that it's pretty helpful. 
it shows us exactly where it is. It's functions.js colon six. That colon six means it's on line six. So what do you know? Line six, bam. So it tells us something's wrong there. And what do you know? Type error, assignment to constant variable. That's not allowed. The second you declare a constant and you assign it a value, it's locked. You cannot change that value again. So it's when do you want to use this? It's kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, but usually you want to use a constant whenever you're creating a variable and you don't want that value to change. And in the case of our day of weeks example, that was a perfect time for a constant because we had an array that was the day of the weeks in a very specific order that we don't want to change. We don't want some other developer to come in and say, hey, this idiot, why'd he put Sunday first? And then they reassign it. That's locked. And that const keyword is actually like a signifier, like a message to another developer who might look at your code like, hey, there's a reason that this variable is a constant and its value shouldn't change. So just know that if you're creating programs and in a scenario like that with days a week, where you're assigning a value to a variable and you want that value to never change, you can use constant. One other thing I want to cover before we move on um, is a better or just a different way of dealing with strings. So if you remember earlier with our day of week example, like we had happy Wednesday, that was the end of the message, right? Or that was the end result but we had happy and then we had the plus sign, then we had our function call, then we had another plus sign with the exclamation point. Like it starts to look cluttered really quick and we'll do a quick example here. So we'll have a variable name set to my name and then we could do something like this and we do my name is concatenation. We add our variable name, another concatenation and we'll just do like a period like that. Save it, go back to terminal run that and we see my name is Adam. So that works, but there is another way that you might prefer instead. And that's what's known as a template literal. So what we can do is just below this, just so you can kind of see the two by, side by side, we're going to do a uh, console.log, but instead of a single quote, like we've been doing, you have to do a back tick. And the back tick is that key that's usually just below the escape key on your keyboard. So we'll do a back tick and then we'll do my name is, and now instead of the plus signs and the variable, what we can do is just dollar sign, open curly brace like that. We'll do name, close curly brace, and then period. So now you can see it's essentially the exact same string without all the plus signs, but then whenever we need to reference a variable, we just wrap it in the dollar sign open curly brace, close curly brace. So we'll save that, go back to our terminal, run it, and you see they both print the exact same thing. So whichever style you prefer, just one of those things I kinda wanna throw out there uh, for you going forward. All right, so we're gonna finish up by writing one more function, but this time the function is going to have two parameters instead of just one. And what this function is going to do is it's going to calculate the sales tax of an item. So we're going to give the function a price and then we're going to give it a tax rate and then it's going to multiply those two together and tell us what the sales tax of that item would be. So we're going to go to Visual Studio. We'll just delete all this. Again, we're going to start with the function keyword and we'll just call this function calculate sales tax. And we're going to have two parameters. So we're going to have the price of the item and then we do the comma and we'll do tax. So that's our function declaration. We're going to have a, or a price that's going to be given to us as well as a tax. And what we're gonna do is we're going to console.log these two values because we're gonna illustrate some things going forward. So what we're going to do is use the new template literal syntax. We're going to do price is dollar sign price like that. And then we'll do the same thing for tax. So just copy and paste that. And then we're going to do return price times tax. So these are just, you know, for us to inspect and see the values that are being passed into the function. And then here's the actual code of our function where we calculate the sales tax 
returning price times tax. And then down here, we're going to do let result equals call our function calculate sales tax. And we'll give it a nice round number 10. And then we'll say our sales tax is 15% that would suck. So console.log and then again we'll do the template literal syntax. We'll do sales tax is dollar sign and notice what I did there. So we did the dollar sign open curly brace, close curly brace with result, but then we also threw another dollar sign in front of it because it's currency and you know it's just nice to see the dollar sign in front of our result. So we'll save that go to iterm, I'm going to clear this, we'll run our code, and we see price is 10. Okay, that makes sense because price was our first argument when we called the function. Then it says tax is 0.15. Okay, that makes sense because 0 .1 0 0.15. And then finally it says the sales tax is 1.5. Okay, so we see that everything's working correctly so far. Now remember earlier we said that the names of the parameters doesn't matter, right? So we could just change price to A, change tax to B, we'll change, whoops, that, we'll change that, change that, and that. So we've left everything the same function, like in terms of functionality, but we just updated price to A tax to B. So what we're going to do is we're going to save that, come back here and run it, and everything should be the same, right? Because those parameter names are just placeholders. Even though price and tax is way more descriptive, it's just placeholders, so everything should be the same. So we'll run this, and sure enough, we see price is 10, tax is 0 0.15, and sales tax is 150. But now we're going to go back to our code. And whoops, we're just going to undo that A, B addition that we did. So we'll get back to here. So now, hopefully you're starting to see why the parameter names kind of matters. Because even though it doesn't affect the functionality, it's it helps the function be a bit more descriptive when you're reading through it. Price and tax is helps me reason through the code and make sense of it way more than just A and B. Um, so we see that updating the parameter names doesn't affect functionality, but what happens if we go down here and we reverse the ordering of these? So rather than 10 comma 15%, we're gonna do 15% comma 10 like that. So we'll save that, go back to our terminal, and remember up here we have prices 10, taxes 15%, sales taxes 150 we run our code now, you'll see that the sales tax is still the same, but the price is now reading 15% and the tax is 10. And of course, the end result isn't affected here because at the end of the day, it's just uh, multiplying these two, t two values together. But you can see that when we're calling this function, the ordering of our arguments does matter. While the naming of the parameters doesn't matter within the function, the ordering of our arguments when we're calling the function does matter. Because, I'm sorry, because think about this. The function is saying, it's a calculate sales tax function. What does it need? A price and a tax. When we come down here and call that function, we have to provide it price and tax in order. Because, once we get within the function, 10 maps to the first parameter, 15 maps to the second parameter. So the second you swap the values of those, once you're inside the function, it's just looking, okay, what's the first value? 15%, okay, that's price. What's the second one? 10, okay, that's tax. So when you're calling the function, the ordering of these does matter. We can solidify this concept on why the argument ordering when you're calling the function matters so much with a more robust example of this calculate sales tax uh, method. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna modify this function. I keep saying method. In programming, some people say method, some people say function. They're the same thing. So if you hear those two terms, know that they're talking about 
a chunk of code, a chunk of reusable code that you can call. So this function, this method, we're going to update a little bit. And rather than just taking in a single price and applying that tax to it, what it's going to do is it's going to take in an array of prices and apply that tax to every single item. And then it's going to return the sales tax as an array. So rather than just doing price times tax, it's going to do price times tax for each price in the array and then return us an array of the sales tax that should be added. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, I'm just gonna delete this, we'll delete this. So we're back to like our basic uh, function declaration. But what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna update the parameter name to prices just because it's a little bit more descriptive. We're not just getting a price, we're actually getting prices, it's plural. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare an empty array result because this is the array that we're going to put the sales tax calculations onto. So we're going to start with an empty array and then we're going to return the populated array with all the sales tax. And then below this, what we're going to do is write a for loop to iterate through this prices that we get passed into this function. So we'll do let i equals zero, i is less than prices dot length i plus plus so that's our loop so we're going to start at zero iterate until we get to the end of the prices array and increment our counter by one every time and then within this we're going to do result dot push remember push says appends new elements to an array and returns the new length of the array we don't care about that we just care about adding elements to an array so we're going to call push and we're going to push the prices array at the index, at the specific index we're iterating through, so that individual price, and we're going to multiply it by the tax. So it's essentially what we were doing before. We did price times tax, but now because we're iterating through an array, we have to use our bracket notation to get the specific uh, element within the array, and then we also put the whole thing inside of push to push the result onto this result array up here. And then down here, we're just gonna do return result. So that's our function. So it's gonna get prices, it's gonna get a tax rate, it declares an array, it loops through the entire array, and for every price in the array, it multiplies that price by tax, pushes it onto this results array, and then we return the results array. So down here, I'm gonna do console.log. We'll call our function, and now instead of just a single price, we're going to provide it an array of prices. So we'll declare our, or we'll add an array here. We'll do one, uh, five, 10, and then our second argument is going to be our tax rate. So now we have our first argument, all of our prices. Second argument, our tax, or our tax rate. So we'll save that, go back here, clear that, run our code, and we see, okay, we get 15 cents, 75 cents, and a buck 50. So it went through 15 cents, uh, 75 cents, and a buck 50. So now, let's see what happens when we reverse the ordering of our arguments. Because in our previous example, it didn't really illustrate why this could be a problem. Because all the function did was multiply two values together. So if you swap those values, multiply them, it's still the same thing. But now, we have an array and then just a number. And it iterates through the array, multiplying each element by that tax number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down here, cut, cut that, and then after point 0.15, we'll add our array. So we'll save that, go back to our terminal, run this, and you'll see the first run got us the results we wanted, the second result just returned us an empty, an empty array. And the reason it did this is because once we call this function, I'm sorry, once we call this function, it goes to calculate sales tax. So we're in calculate sales tax. What's prices? It's 0 0.15. What's tax? It's this array of numbers. We go down here, let result equal an empty array. That runs just fine. 
for let i equal zero, i is less than prices dot length. Uh, let's see what 0 0.15 evaluates to. So once again, we can go here, open up developer tools. We'll do length, undefined. Length on a number is undefined. So this never happens. If i is equal to zero and i is less than undefined, so once again, we can go back here, we can do zero is less than undefined, false. This loop never runs because this evaluates to falsy on its very first uh, evaluation. i is equal to zero, is i less than 0 0.15 length, which is undefined, which is false. It never runs. So all that happens is it never enters this for loop, it returns us the result, which is still an empty array, and that's what we see here. If you want to see the result of this expression, you don't have to go into the REPL either. You can just do it here if you want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this one, because this is the function call we're concerned with, right? When we swap the prices and the tax, when we put our tax rate first and then our prices second. So Rather than going into the REPL, what we can do is just hard code this condition right above it. So right up here, we're gonna do console.log and we'll use our backticks and we'll say result is, and then we're going to use that template literal syntax. But rather than putting a variable here, what we're gonna do is just put that condition, the hard coded i is less than prices.length. And Remember, on the first pass, i is 0, so we'll do 0 is less than, and our tax rate is 0 0.15 dot length. So that's what we want to see, right? We want to see what is the actual result of that uh, when we run our code with this ordering of the arguments. So we'll save that, go back to uh, the terminal, we'll hit node functions.js and we see result is false. So that's why this loop never runs because on the first pass, i is zero, prices is 0 0.15, prices.length is undefined, and then you're comparing is zero less than undefined, which is falsy, which means this loop never runs in the first place. And we can prove this by doing console.log, this should never be seen. So we'll save that, go back to terminal, run it again, and we don't see that console.log statement within the for loop. All right, so that's all I have for this week. Um, if you're following along with the blog post at this point, you will be committing your code to GitHub, but the code that I'm gonna commit to GitHub isn't what we have right here. What I'm gonna do is actually commit the exercises and the solutions to the exercises. So if you haven't worked through that yet and you're, you don't wanna see the answers, pause the video right now because I'm about to work on them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just copy this code right here and we'll go back to Visual Studio, we'll paste that in and let's see what it says here. So it says, to practice, finish implementing the greet by day function so that when it's called, it prints the greeting message we created earlier, happy Wednesday, where Wednesday is whatever day of the week it is. So we'll go back to Visual Studio, save this, and let's just run this. So we'll do node functions, nothing. And that's because it's calling the greet by day function, which does nothing. That's the function we're going to write. All right, so this is the result it wants. It wants to say happy Wednesday. Now we already know, we wrote this function up here, day of week, and what that does is it gives us the day of the week using this date.getDay function, which returns a number, and then it uses that index to access the day's array, giving us the specific element within the array. So we know this is going to give us the day of the week in human readable form. It's not gonna be a number, it's gonna be one of these strings. So because we already know we're getting the day of the week back from this function, all we need to do is take care of happy and take care of the exclamation point. So here, we're going to delete that. And we see, okay, calls greet by day and it passes it an argument now, which is a date. So up here, we're going to specify a parameter. 
we expect greet by day to receive something. And what we're going to do is we're going to do console.log. And we're going to use the backticks for the template literal syntax. And we're going to do happy because we see it down there. And then where we want the date to be, or the day of the week, we're going to do dollar sign open brace. And then we're just going to do day of week. And then, actually, I don't like that being now. That should be date. So we'll change that to date, call day of week, pass it date, close brace, close back tick, close parentheses, and then we'll add a semicolon there. And actually, I just noticed we're missing the exclamation point. So after day of week and before that last little back tick, we're going to put exclamation point. So we'll save that. Go back to our terminal, run that, happy Thursday. So that works. All right, so now we can move on to the other exercise. Uh, just going to copy and paste this. Go back to Visual Studio Code. I'll paste it down here. And I'm actually just going to comment all of this out real quick. So we'll scroll down here. And let's go back to the blog post. It says, for this exercise, update the functionality of calculate sales tax to return an array containing the price with the sales tax added to the original price. Okay, so before we were just calculating the sales tax, but now we want to calculate the sales tax and add it to the original price. So here you can see calculate sales tax has three prices with 0 0.15, but now instead of just 15 cents, 75 cents, and a buck 50, we see 115, 575, and 11.50. So let's write that uh, that function. So this is where it's being called. We just need to add our code here. So again, we're going to declare a variable result. We'll set that equal to an empty array. And now we need to iterate through uh, each price in prices. So we'll do for let i equal zero. i is less than prices dot length. i plus plus. And now instead of pushing price times tax onto result, we need to push price times tax plus price onto result, right? So we'll do result.push because this is going to add whatever's within this to the array. And then we're going to do prices at the current index plus prices at the current index times tax, right? Because before we just had this, price times tax. That gets a sales tax, but now we get sales tax plus the price. And then below this, we'll do return result. So save that. And when we run this, we should see 115, 575, and 1150. So we'll go back here, run that. And we see 115, 575, and 1150. All right, now we're just going to wrap this up and commit this code to GitHub. So the first thing I'm going to do is come over here and actually, let me just make sure I have the naming convention right. Web dev dash. All right, so web dev dash functions. Leave all of that as its defaults. Then I'm going to go back here, do git init, and then we'll do git add period to just add everything uh, in this directory. So we can do git status. We see that we have our functions.js file ready to be committed. Uh, then we'll do git commit m add functions. And we'll go back here, copy this command right there. And by the way, I understand we haven't done a big deep dive into Git, but that's a video that's coming in the future. For now, I just want you guys to be able to push your code out there, have it so that you could show somebody else. You actually have some public proof that you're trying to learn how to code, but we will get into like a little Git uh, tutorial eventually. Um, so back to this, I'm gonna copy this uh, command that links my current directory to my GitHub repository. And then I can just do git push origin master. And I have to add my credentials because I'm using an account I don't normally use. 
And once it's done, you can come back here, refresh, and bam, there you go. There's the file that we created. If you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate you subscribing to the channel, leaving a like below. And if you guys have any questions, any feedback, uh, feel free to leave a comment below. Or if you want like a better way to have conversations about some of the code you're writing, um, and if you want like direct access to me, you can just join the Discord server. I created a Discord server just for this series, so rather than trying to paste code into YouTube comments, you can just join Discord and we can talk there. I have a link below to the channel, so feel free to join. Hope to see you there.